You can think of music as a series of notes or data points, millions of data points. This is music to the ears of Alex White, founder and CEO of Next Big Sound, a music analytics company that compiles massive amounts of data about musicians, concerts, and social media. Give him a list of hundreds of thousands of new artists, and Next Big Sound can crunch an algorithm that creates a short list of the artists poised for huge commercial success. It's proving to be a big idea. The company has just been acquired by Pandora Internet Radio. The news indicates that the company's comet-like rise and its appeal to music companies desperately seeking pop success in a saturated market. Next Big Sound isn't alone in striving for an innovative approach. Ryan Leslie, a Harvard government major who became a Grammy-nominated recording artist, has removed his music from iTunes and launched a company to reach fans in new ways, and he's made more money as an independent than ever before. Alex and Ryan are here with us. They're joined by Atlantic senior editor Derek Thompson. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. This is a really exciting panel that uh, has very obviously been preordained for two reasons. The first reason it's been preordained um, is that Alex just sold uh, his company that he founded uh, in 2008 uh, to Pandora, I believe, 48 hours ago or 72 hours 24. ago? 24 hours ago. We're just so thankful that they, that they timed this sale to New York Ideas. Um, we really do con- control the business world in that way. The second way that this panel is preordained is I was doing some research on Ryan, um, and I came across a January 2009 article. So this is just a few months after uh, Next Big Sound um, was founded. And there's a quote in it that says, uh, me and you, an article that Ryan wrote, Uh, a a song that Ryan wrote, Me and You was more than a hit single, it was a sound, and one that would push Leslie into the anxious purgatory of next big things. They are now friends. The word next big sound is in this sentence. Obviously, this is a preordained panel in many ways. Um, Alex, to start, um, I think when I describe what you guys do, I always am greeted with a combination of great excitement and great confusion. So clarify for us, um, how do you predict uh, hits? So we track the online activity of every artist in the world at Next Big Sound. So this is Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud, Wikipedia, Tumblr, Instagram, on and on and on. Uh, We launched in 2009, which means we have over five years of historical data for all of these artists. So we can see on a daily basis how many new plays, new fans, new comments, new downloads. patented an algorithm around what's the likelihood that every artist is going to break within 12 months from today. So, for example, when, when we first talked, uh, maybe three years ago, um, you mentioned an artist that I had never heard of, and you predicted that she would be something huge. Her name was Ariana Grande, and she is now, I think, arguably one of the top five, maybe even top three female artists um, uh, on the charts. Uh, what you were looking at, essentially, was you were sort of pattern matching her rise of mentions and Instagrams and all of this with previously successful artists? Is that it? Yeah, so it, it, it's not um, too complicated other than uh, tracking all of the data for the entire music industry. Um, <laughs> once you do that, um, it's a pretty straightforward idea. There's always been kind of machine listening technology around like hit predictor score and that sort of thing. What we're saying is, is nothing to do with the quality of the audio of the track. It's simply what's the reaction in the marketplace and how does that compare to every other reaction for a new track uh, that's introduced. So it's not, Ariana Grande wasn't the first to release a new music video on YouTube or Vivo. How did the initial reaction and the spread of that music compare to every other successful artist? And then how do we update that on a daily basis so that it takes into account all the new information that comes in? Great. Ryan, uh, your first album in 2008 sold 180,000, um, and the royalties uh, didn't even cover the $100,000 advance uh, from the label. You then released another album, sold 12,000, and made almost twice as much money. Um, talk to us a little bit about this new model that you're working on and, and why it can make artists like this uh, so much richer than under the label. Yeah, so what's super interesting about uh, what Alex does and why it's really interesting for us to be sitting here on a panel together is 
he's actually tracking uh, anonymous data, right? So uh, the number of times your record is streamed on Spotify or the number of records you've sold on iTunes or the number of times someone's checked you out on Wikipedia. And for an independent artist, that data is super valuable, but what's more valuable is the ability for me to actually just say thank you to the people who actually buy my music. So if you want to raise your hand right now, the last album you actually bought, if you got a thank you from the record label or the artist, right? <laughs> so basically I built uh, an SMS platform to be able to actually send a simple text message that says thank you to every single person that buys my album. In order to do that, I had to take my music off of iTunes and um, I only sold 12,000 albums. But uh, from those 12,000 people, because I could say thank you, because I knew who they are, uh, because I know what cities they live in when I did my tour, because I know uh, what size t-shirt they wear when their birthday is, um, I'm applying real business Go figure, right? Mm -hmm. Applying real business tactics to a small business like mine, which is a music business. And um, over just about 15,000 people, last year I did about $2 million in revenue, gross revenue, and uh, 550,000 of that was direct to consumer revenue. And so I think that um, there's, a, there's, a, there's an idea that if you actually know the people who support you, if you actually know the people who want to um, give you an opportunity to do what you do well and you acknowledge them and you appreciate them, uh, they'll give you more money because, uh, uh, I mean, yeah. feel free to jump in. I think, yeah. I think people forget that fa the word fan is short for fanatic yeah. and that's exactly the, the people you're targeting. What's so interesting about this is that um, right now it seems to me that like the dominant narrative about the music business is that you have not um, the incredible monetization of a niche audience, but rather scale that doesn't pay, right? Isn't that like every, every article that we seem to read now is about how the, uh, Spotify did all these streams and no one got paid, or Pandora did all these streams and the artist didn't get a whole lot of money. And what's interesting is this is, this is that model sort of flipped on its head, right? It's, it's not um, my YouTube song was listened to by 50 million people and I made enough money to buy a Subway sandwich. It's my song was downloaded by 50,000 people, which wouldn't be impressive for YouTube, but I made millions of dollars. Uh, who is this? For whom is this business model right? And should, shouldn't, shouldn't everyone just, just go to it if it turns out to make them so much richer? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's, it's right for people who actually can get into the mindset of not wanting to be Ariana Grande, right? So you got to think. I don't think anybody uh, decides like, oh, I want to be a huge rapper. I want to be a huge singer so I can make the same money as a UPS driver, right? No, no one does that. They, they think like, oh, man, I want to be a huge singer so I can, I can perform at the Super Bowl and I can afford the, you know, the the dolphin outfits for right. my dancers, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so, 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 so when you think about that, the dolphin outfits shark. and the, uh, yeah, the shark, the or, shark. Yeah. oh yeah, yeah, yeah shark, yeah, right. this is much meaner than dolphin, <laughs> right? But I mean, when, when you think about that, it costs a lot of money to put that together. Right. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I, I've, I've always, you know, I've seen, I've seen the entire spectrum, but for me, it's just about giving people the opportunity that if you do want to make a living being creative, I think that that's a great contribution, cultural contribution, right? So instead of actually having to worry about investing your time doing something that you don't love to do, invest all your time into something that you love to do and your contribution to the world is going to be so much better. So we, we have a data science team at Next Big Sound and not to get too philosophical but one of the hardest parts when de deciding um, what success is, is the definition of success because it's, you need to quantify it in order to build an algorithm to support it. And so I've had hundreds of conversations with artist managers and the whole music industry just tell us what success looks like so we can backtrack five years and you know, predict what success will be in the future. And I'm not joking that we couldn't nail down a definition of success. We built it in such a way where you can sub in what success means to you. So there's different success criteria. So success for a brand like Pepsi um, might be to hit a billion in YouTube views uh, you know, and get that crazy reach. Um, success to an artist might be, you know, sustainable revenue and a growing career. Success to 
you know, an agent is different than a publisher, promoter, and defining success is, is the starting point and, and a lot more difficult than I ever expected. Right. I mean, these are two very different... I mean, on the one hand, when I started reporting on, on Next Big Sound and started talking to you, um, the sort of hits that I was thinking you guys were predicting were the Ariana Grande type hits. But what's cool about your juxtaposition on the panel is that you're having this, you know, a different definition of success, but you're using a lot of the same inputs. Right. You're, you're studying your fans, you're figuring out what they like, you're trying to service them in the best way. Right. Well, I mean, the, the real bottom line of this for me is to, um, is to, I don't know if this is a word, but de-anonymize my audience, right? And so, as artists, uh, we, we make music and then we decide like, you know, there's too much scale of inbound traffic. You know, we can't manage, you know, I got 560,000 Twitter followers. I can't manage that, right? And then we find that these platforms are actually selling for billions of dollars, right? And I, it's my work, my ideas, my Instagram photos, my YouTube videos. I'm giving it away for free to create billion dollar platforms, right? And so I'm interested in creating an audience bank for artists, right? So how many of my Twitter followers do I actually have mobile numbers on? So when I actually do press that button and I want everyone to know about my concert, I want everybody to know about my new release, it's not a 0.02% engagement rate. It's actually a 50 or 70 or 95% engagement rate. And that ownership of that information is so critical and I think that the rate of change is just astounding. So when we started tracking this activity in 2009, we wanted to reverse engineer the billboard charts and find you know, which artists are likely to be popular at their earliest possible stage. The only source anyone cared about was MySpace. And that was the first data source we integrated with uh, Akon's MySpace page. Yeah. Um, then we added I like, I meme, and a bunch of sites that no longer exist anymore. This is, this is the fall of 2008. Fall right? of 2009. 2009, yeah. okay. And that was like five, six years ago. So Facebook hadn't launched their pages. Um, Spotify hadn't entered into the US. It was a totally different climate and market. Um, and, and it just changes so quickly. And each of those platforms, like Facebook, you now pay to access the fans that you work so hard to build. And, and I think that ownership is key. One of the interesting things is that um, all this information in the hands of the labels um, uh, doesn't necessarily produce better music or better hits. You know, one thing that you said earlier on is um, uh, you guys are, are uh, sort of, you know, philosophically indifferent or not even looking at or trying to measure the quality of the songs or the chord progressions. You're just looking at the response. Um, and, you know, as, as radio, for example, has gotten uh, a lot more sophisticated about measuring what its audiences are listening to, it's simultaneously gotten a lot more repetitive. Um, the top song uh, from uh, 2013, Blurred Lines, um, to say nothing of its quality, was, abs was played 70% more than the top song from 2003. Um, and it's because radio realizes that people just want to hear things they're familiar with. They want to hear the hits over and over again. Um, I'm interested in, you know, in, in, in your take on, on this idea that um, as the formula gets smarter and smarter, um, uh, the music uh, potentially gets more redundant. Um, is this something that, that you find or that you think about? Yeah, all the time. So um, I heard someone say, we're not in a tech bubble, we're in an uptown funk bubble. <laughs> uh, and, you know, what's really interesting, there's a study done on... Um, the number two through number 10 or number two through 100 songs on the Billboard top charts. And there was, uh, you know, lots of formulaic songs there. But the number one songs, the far and away most popular ones, are the ones that, you know, don't follow the set formula from, you know, that the other ones are, are, are following. So think about Lord coming out of New Zealand and, and with a sound that no one had heard. And that's where, you know, the music business is so endlessly fascinating fascinating is it's this collision of art and commerce and the you know most popular ones are different than the other ones although there is a lot of derivative works like there are in all creative industries on your end um, is there a sense that um, as, a, as a songwriter that there are certain uh, there are certain melodic patterns that people like that there's a certain math to to writing pop hits that people will find memorable um, do you think about it this way or do you just sort of let it flow I mean, if there was a math to it, I mean, I think most people would try to go to that math class <laughs> right. to try to, you know, get their accounts built up based on the you know, results of that math class. And for me, um, the beauty of actually being able to figure out how to uh, make a living 
off of a smaller audience has actually been able to free me creatively, right? right? Because when I'm actually making records for an audience of 100,000 or 200,000 or a million people, a lot of times your record company, and I was in one, they would say, hey, stick to the formula. You're going to lose your fans. We got to, you know, we can't afford to lose half of your fans. And the beautiful thing about actually being able to play to 15,000 or 10,000 people is that if I decide tomorrow that creatively I want to make a country album, I only need to find 10,000 country fans that want to take that journey with me. And so um, I think it's really freeing creatively to be, able to be able to figure out how to make a living from a smaller number of people. At the same time, you must, there must be some sort of feedback that you get, that you'll, you'll try a song and lots of people will like it. And even if there's no label telling you make that song again, there'll be a certain inherent um, uh, interest in you know, keeping those good feelings going, and so you'll want to do something similar again, right? So there, there's still a, um, a pressure not to be formulaic, um, but to find what works and to keep sort of hitting it again and again, right, as an artist? Um, I guess it comes back down to what Alex was talking about. How do you define and measure success? So if you measure success by people responding in a certain way, then maybe you keep doing it that way. But I mean, I'm almost a living example. My Grammy-nominated album was because I was running around New York City chasing models and writing love songs. And then, you know, my last two albums have been just straight rap albums and all. I've, you know, people told me I've alienated my initial audience. And so uh, I'm probably not the right person for that question. Okay. <laughs> I just want to talk yeah. for a second about the, you know, just understanding your audience and, and what success means to you. And, you know, for the longest time, um, just because of, you know, logistics, the label's customers were Tower Records and Virgin Megastores and these folks that bought huge orders of, of CDs, and it's been this, this awesome, you know, business for us to be in to help them better understand what the audience is. And it's not just labels, it's every artist, manager, and their teams around them. And I think in the future, the best and most successful artist, however you define that, will have a great understanding of who their fan base is, what they aspire to do creatively, commercially, um, and just making that distinction between the art and you know, the music side and the business side of the music business, because it is both of those, those pieces. Great. We only have a few minutes left, um, so I want to ask one sort of big question, have you guys tee off on it. Um, uh, going forward, let's say in the next five years, um, what do you think is going to be one of the more significant changes uh, in either how people discover new music or how they pay for their music? You want to start? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm actually working right now. Uh, so I'm not just sitting here as a, an artist, but I'm, like I said, I've built a technology platform and we've had some really amazing investors. We don't have a big exit yet, but uh, we have some <laughs> amazing investors. And um, the idea is that um, the, the way everything works is, I'll, you know, I'll give you my phone number right now. It's, it's 915-600-6978. And the reason I'm able to give my phone, I'll give it again. Terrifying. 915 <laughs> Six zero zero six nine seven eight, and the reason I'm able to give my number out is because technology enables me to actually meet all of you. It would take me forever to walk around after this and go and talk to every single one of you and exchange my information. But if you send me a text right now, my number will actually write you back and say, "Hey, nice to meet you, but uh, it's an unknown number. Add yourself to my phone book. You'll be able to add yourself to my phone book, and then I'll be able to check if you've ever bought my album, and then I'll send you a link to buy my album if you want to, right? And that's, that's the way I should meet everyone because I'm an artist and I'm independent. And what's so interesting about this is we're going to start working with WeChat. And what WeChat allows me to do, WhatsApp hasn't opened its API yet, but we, what WeChat allows me to do is actually instead of sending you to a link, I can say, hey, would you like to hear my new track? And you say, yeah. And I say, oh, send me a dollar. And you text back, send Ryan one dollar. And then I can send you an MP3 right there in the text message feed. And so um, it's actually interesting because... For people that don't have smartphones, this actually works better. So when right. we're looking at emerging territories like Africa that don't actually have smartphones yet and they're, they're transacting specifically through the SMS conversation, uh, it opens up a lot of opportunity for me to you know, get support in places that don't have credit cards or, or bank accounts tied to their Apple Pays or Google Wallets yet. All right, Alex? That gave me plenty of time to think it all <laughs> think out. Of um, so I led a panel at South by Southwest called Top of the Charts in 2015, How Artists Will Become Famous Five Years From Now. This was given in 2010. We're in 2015, obviously, now. And there was this sense with Napster 15 years ago and with MySpace 10 years ago that there's this crazy democratization of the Internet and anyone can become famous overnight and, and, and all of that. And, and still, even today, 10 out of 10 of the top acts 
our typically major label on any given week. And, you know, there's terrestrial radio, which is still a huge part of the music industry ecosystem, and there's a lot of other forces at play. I think what's so exciting about the next five years is this kind of um, access versus ownership model and just uh, on-demand listening and, and being able to hear music interact with, with the artist and have the artist be able to understand and gain a better audi uh, sense of who their audience is. And I think when the numbers, you know, you know, double, quadruple, triple, um, it becomes really exciting economically for individual artists and creators, for uh, the music industry as well, and really healthy and get us back to even a bigger place than we were uh, in, the, in the, pu the bubble of uh, 2000. Great. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Text Ryan. Listen to Pandora. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys.